Thank you all for coming. Um, thank you, Alison. And um, I'm sure this is going to turn out to be a, a really fascinating conversation between two of the most respected practitioners in their, in their fields, uh, architect David Chipfield and the artist Graham Gussin. Um, David is the, uh, the architect of numerous buildings around the world, um, including the Neues Museum in Berlin, which is, I think, widely considered to be a contemporary masterpiece, and more recently in Britain, two public galleries, uh, Hepworth Wakefield and Turner Contemporary in Margate, um, both of which opened last year, and both of which last week were awarded um, Building of the Years in their respective um, regions, and will now be considered for the Sterling Prize. Graham Gussin is uh, an artist whose work is similarly international in presentation, and in recent years has been seen in Seoul, in Sharjah, and now in Elephant and Castle. Um, you can also see it just across the river in uh, Tate Britain, um, whose rather wonderful film Spill is on display at the moment as part of their recent, recent acquisitions. Um, my my uh, concern here is not to provide a, a fulsome or even an adequate introduction to the work of both people. Um, that's what Google is for. <laughs> what I'm rather more interested in is, is maybe to suggest something which their practices both share and hopefully um, invite them to, to talk about that at, at greater length afterwards. Their work actually has actually come together at a certain point and that seems to be a good place to start. Um, the opening of Turner Contemporary in Margate last day, in April last year. And that opening day, Graham showed a version of Illumination Rig, which is a work which he will talk about in greater detail, but which consists, as you can see from this image, of a, of a number of film lights which were placed around the vicinity of the building, but which didn't directly illuminate it. And I think at its simplest and at its most complex, light is something which these two people share in their work. And in a sense, light is the thing which brought them together in that place as well. Because of its very particular geographical location <coughs> um, on the East Coast, but with westward facing sea views, Margate has some of the most extraordinary light in the country. Turner famously said to Ruskin, the loveliest skies in all Europe. And it's why our greatest painter made Margate his second home lodging in a, in a building which sat, Long Gong, which sat on the site which, where you now find the gallery which bears his name. So you've got rock, light, art, building. It's a very simple schematic, but in some ways it, it very neatly encapsulates um, something which I think both these practitioners share, which is this relationship between the material and the immaterial. Perhaps that needs rephrasing, though, because I think one of the things which people often think of as being immaterial, like light or ideas, I think in, in this work is actually made extraordinarily material and is modeled and shaped and experienced as readily as a, as a painting or as exquisitely poured concrete. So this is what we're here today, is to find out what light does the work of David and Graham cast upon each other? Let's find out. <laughs> Graham. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, can you hear me? Am I? Yeah, it's the same <coughs> volume. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, Illumination Rig, which is a, a piece which I did in conjunction uh, with uh, Siobhan Davis recently at Elephant and Castle. I don't know who of you saw it, um, but it's a piece I've made. That was the fifth time I'd made the work. And I'm just going to go through, um, in not really uh, chronological order, but I'm just going to go through the various um, uh, uh, manifestations of that piece of, of Illumination Rig and talk about how that piece uh, uh, relates to sense of place and how it redefines its, or seems to kind of redefine its place um, and situation each time. It's a piece of work that always surprises me when I, when I make it. Um, so... Um, I'm just going to go straight through this, and I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes about this, and there's going to be a few other works that I'm also going to show you, just so you have a more, a broader understanding of, of, of some of my uh, practice and that relationship between material and immateriality. This is the work um, about, to be, about to be rigged in, um, in Sharjah, 
um, which is a, 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 a town, a, work, a working town just north of Dubai. Um, I feel like I've been deserved. Um, uh, and this is the work. Basically, the work consists of lights. Uh, sometimes I use mirrors, uh, generators, cables, and whatever other paraphernalia that this lighting rig brings about. They're very particular lights. They are film lights. Um, they are lights that are used to, 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 to illuminate to stages, etc. So they have a very, they have a kind of a narrative sense to them and a very sculptural sense for me as well, I immediately. Um, I see them as, as pieces of sculpture that come together to make a complete sculpture when they're installed. In Sharjah, we, I had an island to myself. This island was in the middle of a, a man-made lagoon within the city of Sharjah. And this island, uh, interestingly, when I first saw it, um, was, uh, was uh, 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 inaccessible. Um, I asked whether we permission to use the island. They said, no, the island is forbidden. And so the idea of a forbidden island became much more kind of compelling and interesting to me. What, why was it forbidden? And nobody had been onto this island for years. So we discussed it further, uh, uh, and we got permission to go over to the island. We found out the reason it was forbidden was that people were going onto the island from Sharjah because you're not allowed to drink, uh, etc., within the city. And people were kind of coming over to this island to drink. Um, bottles everywhere, mess everywhere, complete... Um, uh, uh, dustbin, really, in a way. Um, but also, really interesting, the fact that this, this island seemed to be ancient somehow as well. It seemed like it had been there for millions of years, but also somehow just been made. I, love, I like this kind of, it's a kind of very Robert Smithson kind of approach to, or to kind of looking at landscape, I guess, the kind of age of it, its layering, etc. So I was very interested in this uh, as an island. But as soon as they gave me permission to do the illumination rig, um, uh, which I was very grateful about, um, things began to, to began to change very rapidly on, on the island. And the next day, 20 people in uh, red overalls arrived on the islands in order to tidy it up. They, were, they, were, they did not want this piece of land to be shown in, its, in, its, in the aspect that it existed in. They wanted to, to re-clear to re, uh, re it and to make it look respectable. Um, the, the, sub, the, the, the tagline of the, uh, uh, of the exhibition in Sharjah was um, um, art, environment, and the politics of change. And so this, for me, really addressed the subject matter of the Biennale um, and, and was kind of like, it was as if just by, just by illuminating a space, I was changing it already. Um, uh, and so it was like putting a, putting a, starting a motor, which I didn't necessarily have that much control over. Um, so they started tidying the island and then uh, eventually were persuaded to kind of finally leave it alone and I was left to uh, get on with um, running the illumination rig. It runs a different uh, sense. Uh, I mean, originally uh, this piece was conceived as simply the conversion of money into light. That was the initial idea that, that I thought about energy and light and burning something and this very literal transference of one sense of fuel to another sense of fuel and watching it, watching it, spill, it spill out into the landscape. Uh, and, and then it has this other kind of um, uh, feeling, I suppose, about it being, it being light being like a material allowed to just spill out and affect, and then it gets turned off at the end. Um, so it's a very it's kind of conspicuous, conspicuously, um, the conspicuous consumption of energy uh, also fitted into this particular kind of context, this, this particular version of Illumination Rig. So really, um, it's, to, it's to, to, to light the work, to, to light the place, um, and uh, kind of reinvent it. What's also interesting here is that the viewers, viewers of this piece become also the subject of the work. They are the actors, if you like, in the film. So the landscape becomes a set, and people coming into the work are lit by these lights and therefore become animators or animated in, in, a, particular, in a very particular kind of way. See what I mean by this kind of slightly kind of ancient kind of, it looks almost like the moon, there are craters, etc. Um, so the people become the subject. It's kind of quite, a, that's a very important aspect of the work where, wherever it appears. Um, and the, the piece runs uh, from various times as well. For example, here in Sharjah, it ran from uh, two o'clock in the afternoon until two o'clock in the morning for four nights. And people came on a small boat across to the island saw the piece and then went away again. It's a very nice kind of journey to see this work. Uh, other, other locations have had different time 
um, brackets and different amounts of lights according to actually the budget. So that goes back to this conversion of money into, into light. It kind of goes back to budget. You can have one light for four days continuous, or you can have seven lights for three days, for five hours, etc. So it depends on, it's, it's all like the tools or the building, the building part of the work. Um, so things become exaggerated. <laughs> uh, the cables and all of that stuff are not hidden. They're all very much part of the work. That we're very aware. It's quite transparent in that sense. The work is, you see, you see exactly what is happening and how it's being made to happen. But that doesn't, that doesn't kind of decrease the kind of effect. I've always been interested in the idea of what, of, of the idea of effect. Um, what an effect is, and whether an effect can be a genuine, a genuine thing. Uh, this is the, another version of it. This is in the centre of Newcastle City, um, in a very curious space between buildings, just underneath the the, the, the iron bridge that's there. There are there's a kind of collision or near collision of lots of different pieces of architecture, and there, there's a space within all of this that that in a way that it feels like nobody's really thought about. Um, it's a kind of it's a kind of a void. Uh, um, some people use it as a walkway through through from the bridge to the lower part of the town, but it's kind of dangerous and 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 odd. And uh, there are walkways, concrete walkways that are half half built that don't lead anywhere. So I I, I did the same piece uh, within this, and it, it it really had a very different feel to to the, to, to the other pieces here. Accidents were happening which wouldn't happen elsewhere. For example, we had a light shining across the bridge and through these trees, which kind of changed changed this kind of building as uh, completely. I was very interested in this sense of layering in this in this version of the piece, where you've got this one thing upon another, upon another, upon another, and again, this kind of relates back to Robert Smithson and his ideas about about the the most recent thing and the, the and the and the, and, the, and the ancient this. Um, relationship between um, time and material. Um, and, and also here it had much more, uh, there was, it, was, it had this kind of other feeling of about, it, it, it felt like something had happened. It felt almost like a crime scene, for example. Something had happened here, or was about to happen perhaps. There's this sense of imminence in the work. Uh, Maybe I should let the images uh, speak for themselves a bit. Um, so again, audience, the audience become part of the work. Um, and they become spectators in a kind of very interesting way, I think. This is the first uh, version of the piece, which is in a place called Reculva, <coughs> which is on the North Kent coast. And I was invited to do this by the Turner Contemporary people, just at the, right at the beginning of their, um, of their long voyage. Um, they were doing some off-site projects, and they wanted me to. Uh, they, they were talking to me about doing an off-site project, um, uh, and I went to visit them. And Reculva, this kind of cliff, cliff face, uh, cliff edge, sandstone cliff edge, uh, just uh, west of um, of Margate. That's right, isn't it? Yes, um, was was most a uh, most interesting site. I thought you could more or less feel the landscape crumbling. The, the cliffs are so soft that you can. It's kind of quite entropic. Again, a Smithson link. Um, there was a ramp going down to the beach. So I lit this uh, space for, uh, 12 hour, for 12 hours, from 12 noon till 12 midnight, with something like seven lights, I think. Initially, the lights go on during the day, um, and they are very, they're like balls of, they're balls of light floating in the air. They're like, um, they're, they're, and then gradually, as the day goes on and dusk comes, you begin to see the effect of the light rather than just this ball of light. So you see, you see what the lights are doing rather than being. This one, you know, this, this idea of a second, a second sun setting. The sun was setting over here, and then we have this second sun. And, and when I started talking to Turner Contemporary about this per piece, really, one of the key phrases was, well, the lights are really a way of painting directly onto the landscape. Uh, and they, they liked that Turner talked about this idea, about, you know, the light. Um, Jeremy, Jeremy mentioned about the, the, the particular light in Margate, and this was a way of painting directly onto that landscape and, uh, and affecting it. Um, we had a perfect day for that. This is Margate, um, which was uh, last year, um, and this was 
this was the first time I'd done, made the work really in, in such a kind of um, uh, uh, a busy, uh, on a, such a busy occasion. The other, pe the other pieces had really been it illuminated places that were, n were uninhabited, were not being visited. But, um, but this was, of course, there was a whole other event happening here. This was the day the building was opening. Um, so it's very difficult to know what, how to address this or how, what the lights were there to address. Because if I, obviously if I shone, shone the lights at the building, the building was the subject. The building was already the subject. So I wanted to think about the idea of lo lo the location and the surroundings of this building and to, to think about how that building sat or came to be in this space and how it, how it <coughs> readdressed the landscape around it. What was there maybe before and after and what was to come. Um, so again, uh, this was from 10, 10 in the morning till uh, I think 10 at night. Um, we had the most lights on this one. We had something like 15 lights. Um, so people are kind of drawn to them like moths, if, if you like, to a flame. They, they become focuses, uh, <coughs> focal points. Um, uh, and they then, some lights were just pointing directly out to sea. These are 18K um, HMI lights. They're very powerful. So yeah, I was wanted to look at that and, 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 and draw that relationship between the building and the, and the location. Lots of often, people often group around the lights and have their photographs taken, shoot short films, so they become productive in that sense. Mo most recently, this is the um, Elephant Castle piece. This is uh, just down the road from here. It's in a, there was a big hotel there. They've knocked it down. Uh, but the site is presently um, kind of um, in, a, uh, in a kind of limbo between uh, rebuilding um, and its previous status. So, um, so again, I'm, int I'm interested in these spaces which are kind of, uh, yeah, in between um, being something and having been something. They're now, they're now <coughs> nowhere. Um, Funny, people in the, living in these new houses across the road were addressing me as I was installing this work and telling me to get off their land because it was their garden. Um, so obviously they had a relationship to it. Um, and it's interesting to think about this as a garden. Um, here, mirrors were used as well um, to kind of uh, uh, play around with the light a little bit more, kind of reflect it. Um, again, uh, this idea of... Uh, Something about to happen. Maybe somebody's going to be interviewed here. Maybe somebody's going to die here. Maybe somebody is going to do something else. I don't know. Um, so the yeah, narratives kind of open up. Um, and yeah, uh, again, for me, there's this, uh, this the, the ramp, the, the relationship this has to, ha has to earthworks, to Smithson again, and Gordon Matter Clark. The, the relationship between the architecture and the, and the material is all very raw and very open. It's like we're looking at an open wound or a, a, a situation or a condition. Um, but also there's this kind of filmic element of it that this is very much, I, I've always had in my mind that image from 2001 where they find the black obelisk on the moon and they dig a hole and, and they go to visit it and they've got all these lights shining down into this pit and then there's this black obelisk in the middle. It's one of the most beautiful filmic images, I think. Um, so I've always had that in mind that we're, we're, we're lighting something that has been found or is about to happen, um, an event-based work, I suppose. Um, yeah. Um, so a few other works to kind of wind up. I, uh, going on a little bit too long. Um, this is a piece called Dark Corner. Um, I'm just, I've included this just because it's a way that I, it, it just addresses its kind of the architecture that it's found in. It's simply a dark corner. It's a, it's a corner that's designated within a space um, which is painted black and it's called Dark Corner. Sometimes the work I make is very literal like this. So it's, again, very transparent. This is, that's it. Um, this is a, the spill piece, which is a, a related to the lights in the way that this is a single material that's allowed to take course within a given space. And this is um, dry ice spilling out uh, into a, a deserted warehouse, um, filling the warehouse, and then evaporating. And this, this is the piece that's presently on show at Tate Britain. Um, go and see. Um, there we go. 
very seductive material. Uh, this is an image of uh, one of the works downstairs as you come in. These are, uh, these are quite early works. This goes, these go back to the 90s. These are very simple uh, things. The, the piece downstairs, the painting downstairs, is called Transport. Um, I think this might be the same painting, I'm not sure. But basically... It's different. It's different. This maybe is called Remote then, I can't remember. Maybe that's Transport. I can't remember. Um, something I said but can't remember. Um, so basically these are, used, these are made by me saying a, a word into a piece of software. So it's me announcing the title of the painting. So the painting is called Transport and the image is me saying the word Transport. Um, but I'm interested, in, I'm interested in that kind of conceptual kind of link between language and image, etc. But I'm also interested in the idea that this plays with the idea of projection that place, um, landscape, building are, are, are projections and that um, we project into the landscape um, through language and, and material. Um, and that, mm, that might be it. No. Uh, this is also some stills from a piece downstairs which is called Night Street Touch. This is more about territory, uh, pre-existing territory. This is me moving through the streets <coughs> in the block around my studio and in the block around my house, touching things. Um, each shot is something less than about a second long, maybe 1.5 seconds. Um, that, some, that on my wandering through the street at night, I see something, I line up the camera, I touch the thing I've seen, and then I take the camera away. So each shot is a touch. Um, and, and it's kind of the way it marks a space is, is, is territorial, I think. Um, I'm not going to talk about that piece. I'm going to talk about that piece briefly. This is a series of drawings I make called Drawings of Nothing and Nowhere. Um, they originally came from, uh, you probably all know, that uh, Pearl and Dean advertising sequence in the cinema, which is, uh, does it, do they still use that? They don't, do they? <laughs> the, um, you might have to that I grew up with. Um, and these, these abstract boxes float towards you, and they take you, and it's a little bit like the, the uh, Stargate sequence in 2001, where it's, it's kind of, the beginning is a, of immersive cinema, but it's kind of, so it has this kind of reference to popular culture, but it's just a drawing of nothing and nowhere. It's just geometry. Um, it's, that's all up for grabs. <laughs> um, oh yeah, a couple of other references, but I talked about Smithson a lot. Um, Smithson's mirror piece is very important to me. Um, not such a great slide, sorry, but yeah. Um, articulating that sense of place and sight and projection the partially buried woodshed in terms of that relationship to material um, building entropic. Uh, uh, Gordon Matter Clark, um, the way he was you know, opening up these kind of architectural spaces using light, um, the, using the building as material um, and light as material. Um, here we have another Gordon Matter Clark piece. Um, and that is the end. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I shouldn't have said the end. Maybe this is just the beginning. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Or perhaps the middle. I'm really conscious that I don't want to fall off the back of this. <coughs> it's a long way, Jeff. Either of us. Um, so, David. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's, I mean, it strikes me that there are quite a number of um, themes or ideas which, which Graham has articulated which, um, which can be found in your work. And I just wonder if there are any that, that you responded to most immediately. I mean, I think obviously the, the creation of place is, is fundamental to what an architect does. Um, and maybe Margate is a, is a good example, it's something that we, that we both, a place that we mm. both know very well. If you, would, if you would care to talk about that a little, and the, the sort of challenges yeah, that you face. There. There's a number of themes that we can, that we can share and pick up, I think. Um, but clearly, um, the difference between architecture, the way that architects work and the way that artists work, is that we are much more complicit. You know, we are, um, you know, I think what's so powerful about this work is that you are... Um, you are making us look at things um, and you are reminding us of things and you're, you're, you're giving emphasis to things. 
And actually, just so before I build on that theme, I, <coughs> I think the Newcastle project, I think it's particularly interesting for me because I think what, what it, I mean, I think they're all beautiful in, in the sense that it, they achieve this thing of, of, of uh, yeah, uh, giving importance to things that we might not, um, that we might take for granted. And yeah. I think that's something that in our world, you know, is a very important theme. You know, we, we tend to not look enough at those things that are around us and only have interest for the sort of exceptions. And I think these are sort of beautiful, um, you know, and, and it is, there's, a, there's something very potent about this lamp which somehow makes things important. You are attracted, as you say, you're attracted to it, and it seems to change the whole context. Yeah. And nowhere stronger than in that Newcastle condition, in a way, because there you are saying, as you did say, um, a sort of forgotten place, a place that has somehow been made. It's a sort of typical contemporary environment yeah. that's been made thoughtlessly, you know, with huge efforts, actually, because each one of those buildings represents an enormous amount of investment and, um, you know, um, collaboration in terms of uh, money and... Uh, and yet, the result is negligent, in a way. It's a, it's a, it's a, you know, mm. it's a cathedral of negligence, which <clears throat> so much of our city is made out of. And this used to be, I mean, in a way, this was a sort of um, condition that was um, sad, but sort of exceptional. And of course, we had ideas about what our city should look like. You know, they should look like 18th century, you know, should look like Bedford Square or Siena mm. or, or wherever, and of course the reality is they look like that. Yes. They, they do look like Newcastle. They, we are building that type of city because we have no order anymore. We only have singular activity, uncoordinated activities. So we are building these terrible spaces which uh, have no meaning. Mm. You know? But what's interesting is that, and I think this is something we have to live with, and it's interesting that sometimes those compositions are somehow acceptable, you know. I don't know, you're in Hong Kong, you know, and sure. things come together. Mm. Everything has a sort of value, it's being looked after, and, or, you know, there are, there are moments where it doesn't necessarily mean that the social conditions are unacceptable. But I thought what was quite interesting, that just putting a lamp on that space, mm. all of a sudden, you recontextualized it, and it has, it's not quite as ugly, I mean, in, in a way, you could nearly say, I find it sort of interesting that, you know, is it inherent that these spaces, which are consequential, are always going to be bad? Because unfortunately, we do have to confront the fact that that is what we're producing. We are not producing squares and streets. And, I mean, we are not producing coordinated urbanism anymore. We aren't. You know, but I think what's quite potent about that is it's sort of saying, you know, actually, shining a different light on this, you could somehow make it okay. I mean, obviously you're not going to spend your life uh, <laughs> investing in lights shining on ugly spaces in Newcastle, but metaphorically, yeah. um, you know, you can turn an environment. I think that's very interesting. Yeah, it becomes, uh, that's, I think, the way that space becomes engaging again, becomes something to look at rather than, than, than to ignore or to pretend yeah. it isn't there. Um, Although it does, its sinisterness is also there. It does slightly look as if a murder's just, you know. Well, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah absolutely. But uh, um, that's, yeah, I suppose that's one of the, um, by, by what's fascinating to me is, and continues to be with this work, and it's why I've made, will continue hopefully to make it, is that such a simple gesture of place, just pointing a light at something can really, can really bring all of that <coughs> forward, whether it's, whether it's a sinister, sinister space or whether it's a, uh, a beautiful space, or whether it's an urban space or a, or a rural space. I mean, here we had rabbits running across that landscape. I mean, really, rabbit. I mean, it's it's so you you have an idea about what this space is, but then you're you're kind of actually, if you look really carefully, it's it's not quite that. It's something else. Um, uh, and I'm I'm also interested in the kind of notion of the accidental as well. This, I mean, about you know that idea of planning and how something comes about. How on earth does this come about? You know, this is this is poured concrete. This hill by the side here. That obviously, that's some, some kind of support structure for, for building behind it or protection of, or something. But it, 
It's just, it's really kind of pragmatic almost. Just, just, just do that. Don't think about it, just do yeah. that. Um, and and all, so all of that comes to the kind of foreground, I think. What's interesting about this space, because if I'm right, isn't this just at the bottom of the street that was voted the most beautiful street in the country, which is the long avenue up towards, is it the old grey Yes, it's the, bot tower. It's the bottom it's of the that bottom hill. Of that yeah, bit. it's the bottom of the hill where it turns around, and it's just, uh, there, there's a place called the steps, and you walk mm -hmm. up this narrow, these narrow steps, or you enter in a ga from a garage underneath. Mm -hmm. So it's really a non-public space in mm -hmm. that sense. You don't know it's there. But Locals what, do. But what you're pointing out is that we still have con a conventional notion of what we think cities should look mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, we're not producing them. Mm -hmm. We're producing this. Mm -hmm. and this is like the repressed part of the... Uh, yeah, it's the backstage. Yeah. And, um, but it's, it's subconscious, I, could we say but that? It's like, but, well, I think it's... It is, except we're doing it with our eyes wide open. Mm. You know, I mean, I think that's the problem, is that we are, we are part of... And, and that's, you know, that's also what I wanted to to introduce as a sort of architectural perspective that, you know, while, yes, we do work with light, and course, but that's, in, I think, all architects work with light as part one of, you know, our materials, but, you know, towards an end. But I think that's just a tool for us, but I think that the, the difference um, that architect or the, the condition or the predicament that architects find themselves in is that, you know, we are... Um, you know, operating under uh, very different conditions. We, are, we try to find autonomy and independence, and, but at the same time, we are absolutely implicit. We cannot, mm. you know, you're an observer. I think that's what's so interesting is that you can, you know, an, an artist can, can um, you know, you, you have less responsibility. You have a responsibility to ideas and, and, and to, to us in a way. I mean, we're, we, yeah. we, we see artists as people that we, subsidize on our behalf to, to say things and look at things and remind us of things that we often forget and don't have time to concentrate. Architects are, you know, like to think they're a bit like that, but actually we're also a service. So yeah. we have someone who is um, our client, and therefore we are implicit, we, we, you know, we're complicit, we're not. Sure. So the problem for us is that we have to find make these observations, but in a, in, in a way that is wrapped up with all sorts of other, mm -hmm. other things. Mm -hmm. And is it acceptable in some way then to the client, to, to the situation? How, how do well, you someone like Jim Sterling always used to say, you know, never explain anything to your client. Because mm -hmm. um, he thought in this sort of, in this sort of Anglo-Saxon, and I think he's right in some ways, you know, I mean, in a typical Anglo-Saxon condition, except for special clients, and, you know, we have one in this room, so, uh, you know, and this building is a testament to, you know, a, a healthy and a functional relationship between uh, a client and an architect in that whole process. Um, but these, these don't happen that often, and I'm sure Sarah explained to an intelligent client what she wanted to do and what she was trying to do, and that dialogue would have been absolutely fertile and, and important for the success of the building. Um, but in a more robust and more commercial environment, um, you try and explain ideas to a project manager sitting around a table. I mean, they just see money, you know, they just see that as being uh, expense. So the one thing you don't do is, you know, indulge. Mm -hmm. So you tend to have, you know, your agendas tend to be slightly tucked behind a little bit. Mm -hmm except for those, those um, commissions, which are sort of the exceptions with articulate clients and, and, uh, and, a, and a condition where um, everybody is trying to get to the same place. Mm -hmm. I wish that was true of most projects, but it's, it's not. Mm -hmm. Is it more true of a certain type of project? I mean, you're, you're very well known for for museums and galleries, amongst other yeah, things. Yeah, museums are, are, are a sort of green field in a, yeah. way, in a way. I mean, they are a protected site in, in some sense. You know, you are dealing with, uh, you know, curators, museum directors, boards of trustees who tend to have, you know, and their, their, their whole idea is to, to build something, you know, in celebration of their program. Much more difficult if you're doing uh, 
you know, a low-cost housing project or you're doing a commercial office building. Mm -hmm. You know, those, you know there, is, there is a nod towards the idea that, of course, we want the best possible architecture, mm -hmm. and we want, um, but there will be very little commitment to that. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, and, and, and I think that's the problem, is, is that um, the, the, the autonomy that you should, you know, that all creative processes need is very difficult to fight for. And, you know, I mean, I think in, in a way, artists, you know, they're paid for, to be autonomous. I mean, that's, that's what we expect from them. Mm -hmm. um, but architects are, are not. I mean, we sort of label with them with that expectation, you know, we're gonna get this architect, because, you know. But then, um, invariably, they're put, put through the sort of most robust and, and unsympathetic um, process. And, and my, my contention is that because it's become a sort of confrontational process amongst all parties, with the exceptions that we talk about, you know, those rare conspiracies where everybody's on the same boat trying to roughly go in the same direction, generally that doesn't happen. Uh, and because of the confrontational process between planners who are trying to make sure that the worst things don't happen, I mean, here we call we call planning now development control, as if that was, you know, it's like some way of keeping vermin down. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a negative, you know, development control is a description, you know, it used to be called urban planning or something like that. It used to be about, you know, with an idea about what you might think, want things to be, whereas now it's about trying to resist things being any worse. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you have that pressure and you've got all the other pressures which are, are conspiring against. And so the architect ends up as a sort of isolated, um, you know, uh, figure trying, I mean, it sounds pathetic, doesn't it? I mean, I'm, I'm sounding like I'm, I'm... Uh, <laughs> I'm wondering uh, if there's not, you know, a lot of similarity to the artist as well, that the artist also ends up as the isolated figure, not producing the work that, that the majority of people think that we should yes, have. Yes, but you're meant to be the isolated figure. <laughs> we are meant to be doing things that are um, representational of society's condition in a way. Mm. We are, mm -hmm. you're, you are meant to be outsiders. You're well, meant to be outsiders. That's, that's maybe a slightly us. romantic idea of the artist now. I, I think that's maybe shifted, and we're not, we're not really so much the outsiders anymore, that we actually are um, more involved, um, that, 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 that maybe those days are over, that we're not, we're not um, you know, the mavericks or the radicals or whatever. We are actually uh, more, 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 more to do with the, with the, with the centre of things, that we're actually that romantic idea of the the person who informs us um, is, 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 is still, is still there to a degree, I think. That's that's sense yes, of our but duty, you, but it's kind of also... If you had to sit in front of a table of project managers and planners and explain that you wanted sure. to put a bunch of lights on an island in the middle, of, you know, and you wanted to put, <laughs> yeah. put a power... I mean, no, that's, you would I, find I take it diff point. a difficult yeah. argument. <laughs> sure. yeah, it's, it's only because yeah. you have a, a bubble I would end up saying, you. when they ask why, I'd end up saying, because I want to, because you asked me to, or <laughs> yeah. you asked me to do... Yeah. So it's kind of uh, much more intuitive... Yeah, that whereas architecture space. has to be subversive. We have to find architecture within mm. the, the simple task that is defined. I mean, to be honest, most good architects are finding um, qualities which they're never asked to find. I mean, actually, most clients don't even want you. you know? mm. I mean, if you say, yeah, but you know, we've been working so hard on this, you know, try and make it worth it, well, don't bother. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just want, you know, on time, yes. on budget. Yeah. And you're saying, yeah, but quality. So, yeah, of course. I mean, it should look good. I mean, yeah, make it look nice. Yeah, but anyway. <laughs> you know, so, so in that triangle of time, money, quality, time, money, quality, time, money, quality, <coughs> then, you know, from a, from a commercial perspective, the quality yeah. is, you know, the triangle mm -hmm. gets very mm -hmm. shifted. No one's ever going to say it. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course we're going to, you know, it has to be the highest, highest quality. But, they, but the truth is it's not yes. there. Whereas mm -hmm. at least... Uh, with a, a, a um, an artistic venture, there is a, there is the the press. I mean, what's the point of asking an artist to do something and then just beating them up all the time? I mean, I'm sure that happens. Mm. I'm yep. sure there are just bad yeah, there are moments. bad experiences. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, out of that triangle of time, money, quality, the, you only ever get two of those three things. You can never have three <laughs> things, can you? Yeah, but often then you would. <laughs> I mean, just drive around. Yeah. 
London. Um, and does, I, does that then prevent a sort of a very responsive sort of architect architecture? I mean, I can, I can remember you saying at, at one point about the one thing that you never have enough of is time. That, that you would like to, yeah, you I would think, like the opportunity to develop these yeah, things. Architects more. are not paid. You know, good architects are not paid for the time that they spend on a project, and as simple as that. Mm. So what you get, you know, we have a strange thing where we, we call certain practices commercial practices. I mean, what, given that we're all meant to be running a sort of, you know, viable um, office, shouldn't we all, I mean, we're all meant to be commercial, mm -hmm. otherwise, you know, mm -hmm. <coughs> it's embar your meetings with your bank manager are slightly embarrassing, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but the idea is that there are certain practices that work from a commercial point of view to start with. And there are other practices that, you know, I'm sure Sarah didn't make a lot of money on this, wherever she is. Um, you know, she's not starting off saying, right, the fees are that. Uh, that gives me a certain number of hours for a certain number of staff, and that's how we're going. So all you're doing is exploiting the, the goodwill and the, and the commitment of, of a good architect. Whereas, you know, if, again, generalizations are, are horrible and, and normally wrong, but there's so, something underlying it. I would have to say work, working in Europe, the system is more protective, and therefore a young architect gets paid for what they do. That means at the end of finishing a building, they've got some money in the bank. They don't necessarily immediately go and go on holiday, but at least it gives them the opportunity to, you know, employ another member of staff, get a secretary, you know, improve their computers or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, they can actually mm -hmm. go forward. Move on. And I think that my, te you know, my moan, oops, and it's not really a moan for me anymore, you know, I'm sort of old enough not to have to, I'm okay. Um, but my moan is that, that I don't think things have, you know, I've had, always had to work outside of the country. I've always had to work by going other places to find commissions, which is fine. But um, I would have expected by now that a younger generation would be a bit more um, integrated into society. Because my, you know, the point I'm trying to make, I suppose, at the bottom of this is that architects can't, own, can't work as lone figures outside. You know, I, you can't go home and think of a building and say, mm. you know, I've got this great building to do, you know, I just need a site and I just, <laughs> just need 28 million pounds, you know, <laughs> uh, and a client and, you know, I mean, you just can't do it. So you are, you, you are complicit, you have to be. Therefore, we're dependent on that complicity. It's not, you know, you, it's very difficult to, to work yes. against society. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem is that architecture has, in the last years, address that by making a certain type of architecture. I mean, if I want to cut to the chase, I, I think that the, the reason that, that architecture still has a profile is because those protected moments um, have become the identity of architecture. A concert hall in China, uh, a railway station in Seville, uh, you know, Said, wow, look at that, that's amazing. Have you seen that? Have you seen the latest project by so and so in so? -and -so? No, no, I haven't seen that. It's become a destinational mm. thing. I mean, <coughs> since when did architecture become destinational? You know? And what's happened is that that's disguised the health of the patient, which I think is not very good because if you actually just step out the front door and you're confronted with those spaces in Newcastle, or you're, you know, that is actually what we're producing. It's no compensation to the person living in that area to open the, you know, the latest color supplement of, uh, you know, of the Sunday Times and see that there's an amazing new museum in mm -hmm. wherever, mm -hmm. Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, you know, I, I think that this, this um, uh, dysfunctionality between the role of the architect and the way they sit in society um, is not only a shame for us, just, but I think it means that our, our whole raison d'etre is under question. We're just becoming sort of decorators of special projects. And, and I think the struggle to, you know, why are we not building social housing anymore? You know, where, where, what happened to these post-war mm -hmm. you know, ideas that, you know, imagine an architect now 
uh, or a developer, let's imagine a developer going to the bank and saying, uh, I want to do a housing project. I want to build uh, the best quality apartments for the lowest possible price, because I think the market needs that. And investors would say, how? Uh, you got it the wrong way around. Mm -hmm. Surely what you mean is mm -hmm. you want to build at the lowest quality for the maximum price, because that's actually what, how the market mm -hmm. works. That's, you know, we, that's what investment does to you. It mm -hmm. says, increase your margins. That's a sort of anti-social mm -hmm. notion, and it, it means that we have no collective or social ambitions anymore, because who else? If government doesn't say, okay, you know, it's not gonna be provided through the commercial sector, therefore we have to step up. Mm -hmm. But essentially, we've, we've gone from, from a post-war condition that said, you know, the best for the most for the least, to, you know, candy and candies providing, you know, 28 million, 120 million pound apartments. I mean, and mm -hmm. we're doing some as well. I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, that's what I'm saying, you know, mm -hmm. one's complicit in this process. Um, but it's an obscenity in a way in terms of, Mm -hmm. How do we get onto this? How do I <laughs> ramble my way? I think it's obviously something you needed to get off your chair. <laughs> we're, talking about, we're talking about light, aren't we? <laughs> light, that was it, yeah. You're sort of rather circuitous. But, uh, light for everybody. Light for everybody, big windows for everybody. For yeah. Well, I think, um, I think in a sense what you're talking about is something which, you know, you can see in this image. Graham mentioned about this historical layering of a place. And... You know, maybe in that, in that post-war moment, you know, sort of Festival of Britain moment, there was a sense of optimism. And optimism in, built, built into it has a sense of the future. It has a sense of making something better. It has a sense of, of a duration. And I think Graham's work is a lot about duration. It has sometimes duration built into it, as he, you know, very explicitly said. It's, you know, one light for four days, or it's seven lights for five hours, or it's, it's whatever. Um, it's back to that idea of economy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, you, you, I think you've spoken a lot about the, the sense of, um, I mean, a related notion of durability, of a building but having a sense of durability. But I think what's interesting about the work is that it, it, it sort of, it, it's reflective about what we have. And in architecture, we expect, it to, we expect there to be some need, and we expect things to be pointing in a certain direction. And I think, what, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that we seem to be in this condition now that things happen to us. Mm -hmm. You know, architecture is something that happens to us. Mm. It do, you know, there is no longer this idea of what a city should look like. Mm -hmm. It yes. looks like what it is the consequence so, of yeah, I suppose unconnected activities. And then yeah. I think what's interesting about, you know, those photographs of Newcastle, you've shined, shined a light on it. Even I, I can imagine in moments showing a certain beauty Absolutely. in this, That's, you know, because yeah. But I wanted, I was interested in the idea, I suppose, of, and this comes back to what you were saying about architecture not being something that happens to us, but architecture being a process and, and the, the built environment being in part of a process and, and in process. And I suppose this is why I'm drawn to these, uh, these kind of uh, sites that are kind of liminal or periphery or in between is that <laughs> sense that, that they are a sense of becoming or, or, or uh, that, they, that they have of materiality and... Uh, yeah, process, process, and that links back to Smithson, I suppose. It's hence my interest in Smithson's is that idea of the, of of of, ma of stuff, of, of material, of material and architecture is, being stuff. But do you stuff. think this is now our contemporary condition? Is that we have to find beauty in things that you know, in, in a way, observationally, more than in terms of yeah, being um, able to create them. Uh, in a way, one would say that about art generally. I mean, I think there's yeah. a general um, shift towards. Um, work which is more observational, mm. more clever in terms of, you know, or mm. astute, yeah. more than relying on conventional painterly or compositional yeah. qualities of beauty or, you know. Sure, uh, yeah, I think, I think hopefully the illumination piece does embody all of those things because it is, as I said initially, like painting directly onto something. Um, but, it, but it also has this kind of underbelly, which is the, which is the more, which is this kind of idea of the site of something or the, uh, the catastrophic or the, even the apocalyptic sometimes, that, that, that that's, like, that's there too. And there is, a, there is a beauty in that, isn't there? There's a draw to that as well, a kind of sp spectacle. Um, 
um, of that, of witnessing something. We don't know what quite, quite sure what it is mm. that we're about to witness or mm. have witnessed. And, and, and it's how we kind of shake it off or come to terms with it. But I suppose the other thing that's quite interesting is that finally, it is quite beautiful as well. Yeah. <laughs> if these things, if those... You're left with that, yes. If it wasn't yes. beautiful, it wouldn't be very yes. interesting. It would yeah. just be a sort of... I think... And I think that... That I think thing between idea and beauty is still quite interesting. I like, I the, I like the word compelling. I want, I want things yeah. to be compelling mm -hmm. when we look at them. And if, if beauty is involved in that as part of its process, I think that's, that's fine. But they can be compelling for other, other reasons too, mm -hmm. just, just through notions mm -hmm. of presence, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very captivating. I, mean, I, I was at the, uh, um, the one at Recalva, the first, the first one. That was incredibly beautiful. It was an incredibly beautiful day. And, mm -hmm. It, it just went through these different stages of, as Graham said, there were these bits where the lights were on, but the sun, it's, it's this strange thing where you realize quite how powerful the sun then is, because you've got these incredibly powerful lights that hurt you if you, if you look at them, you can't actually look at them really, mm -hmm. and yet they cast no light. You would look at the, th one would be pointing right at the floor from about seven feet away, and you couldn't see anything on the floor because the sun was so powerful. Mm -hmm. And there was this strange moment where you think, yeah, you know the sun is powerful, but my God, quite how powerful. You've got these enormous lights and shining onto it. And you couldn't see it. You would go like that, and it wouldn't cast a shadow. It's quite extraordinary. I like the idea of there being too, too much light. It was, too much, it was like excess light. Yeah, it was like, how much light do you really need on a cliff top in North Kent? Mm. Um, I guess if you don't want to fall over the edge, then maybe you can't quite have enough light. But, but there was these really beautiful sci-fi effects, like in this image, where you did seem to have various suns setting over the cliff. And when you got to Magic Hour, you know, film people, they talk about Magic Hour, this point where uh, it's sort of dusk. And, uh, and it was extraordinary. And then when it, but then when it got dark, all you were left with were these sort of arcs of light in complete darkness then, really, which illuminated. And so the activity became very, very different all of the time that sometimes it, the lights themselves were seemed to be just the actors because they were placed like statues or like standing stones in this in this strange landscape but then they became activated there was a certain point where they became more powerful than the sun and they became they be, they were the things that activated the space in some sort of strange magical way i should uh, yes i mean that's interesting if you come up to that because i did with this work, this is the first time I did it, and I didn't know whether it was going to work or not, so it was quite, it was quite pleasing to feel at the end of the day that it had worked. Um, but there was uh, this sense that, that, there was, uh, that the lights were kind of a building material in another sense, was that when you, these lights are so, sh so bright that once dusk had passed and it was darker, that you, you can't see beyond one of the lights. The photographic re record doesn't really tell you the truth because the, the, brights, the lights are so bright that you look at them, you can't see what's beyond them. And then you move past that light, and another, another room opens up, if you like, because there's another light beyond it, which is illuminating the space again. So they are, they can be used, the lights can be used like walls. Um, so you, you, you pass a threshold across, across a line, and then another space is beyond that, which you, couldn't, you simply couldn't see before. And you, so you can, draw, um, you can draw with these things, and, then, and then therefore actually orchestrate in a, in a, in a kind of uh, uh, choreographical kind of way, the way people move around the space. They're kind but of isn't led there, by isn't them. there another quality about this that when you light something, you're giving it sort of importance mm. and light? We, we are drawn to the light, whether that's a light in a house or you know. I mean, if you walked across a moor and you found there was a cottage with a light on, I mean, you you would see that as being homely. Mm. It would represent domesticity. It would it would represent occupation. It would, and that's what I think is quite interesting about that Newcastle thing because the light somehow makes it seem like that place, which is a place where you wouldn't normally want to be, it suggests that you could be there or you mm. should be there yeah. because something It almost gives you permission to be there. Yeah, you've, you've made it, again, let's not say comfortable or mm. something. You've made it somewhere where, um, out of all the other places, whereas normally if it's dark or if it's even semi-lit, it's just uncomfortable. And therefore, that's what I quite like about the light analogy is that I think that it's the same in architecture that in a way uh, you, you, architecture is trying to mediate between us 
and the larger world and tell us that being in this place is comfortable. You know, I mean, to be here is comfortable. So, you know, this is a good one to be in. We don't even need to know what produced that quality. We can dissect it if we wanted to be professional about it and talk about the fact that it's a well-proportioned room, that daylight's coming one end. I mean, someone's clearly taken a lot of care about that, but a lot of people would just walk in and out of this room and just say, just remember that it was a very nice room. It doesn't have to be anything mm. more than that. And that's what we are, you know, whether that's in nature or in architecture or anywhere. Which I, but I think what's interesting about light is that and what you're doing is that you're, you're creating those places where we, we, you sort of appeal to people that they're standing in the right place mm. or yeah, something. Absolutely. Yeah. They are somehow yeah. where they're meant to be. Mm. And that's why I like the Newcastle one, because it's so contradictory. Because mm. normally, you, I guess, one would want to scuttle. You would pass through that space <laughs> as quickly as you could. Yeah. Yeah. across <laughs> that <laughs> place, whereas you've created <laughs> a, a somewhat, you know, a, a space which it, you've cheated in a way. You've, you've yeah. sort of turned the whole thing. And through this device, you've made it sort of seem as if you could be there. That has to do with dwelling, doesn't it? The idea of dwelling. Yeah, in, our, in how we... Yeah. There's loads of questions I could ask here, but maybe um, they should. But maybe they should. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, that's what I was going to say. Um, does anyone have any questions? There is a mic, I think, um, roving. There's one question over here. Focuses on forgotten areas, um, perhaps. To me, that work seems like a first step. It seems like by shining that light literally on these places, we're asking questions. And I'm just wondering what the panel think. How can we go on now from from these images that you've presented? How can we reanimate and and regenerate those parts of the city? What what are who who should be the actors in that, and how can we do it? Um. David, probably. Yeah, just, more David. Just let David do it. Yeah. More David than me. <laughs> but I, I do think there's something very interesting. If you go to a lot of cities now, the cities are lighting buildings. And if you go to some of these completely invented places like you know, Abu Dhabi or Doha or whatever, yeah. it will all be lit up. And it looks so attractive from a long way away. And you go there, you're, you're pulled towards this light, and then there's nothing there. But the idea of illumination is partly to do with making this place sort of more special and more. So society's picked that idea up as well, in a way. You know, I mean, if you light a building, you know, yes. you've somehow given it. Yeah. So there's now this terrible fashion for sort of over-lighting buildings. And sure. I think that was what was interesting in Turner, that you know, the obvious way of you doing your installation was to light the building. And I thought it was very clever that you That goes back to it. something I was saying about the idea of effect. And, and, and how lighting is used as an effect rather than, and, and hopefully with the illumination rig piece, I'm, I'm making the work transparent because it's very, you, you see everything. You see the light as subject, so it's not, it's not an effect, it's yeah. the thing itself. But that, re that relationship between effect and, and material and subject m maybe is something that I'm trying to address. And if we can think about that a little bit more, less effect and, and more actual, <coughs> that's, that's the way forward kind of more reality, I guess, in a way. But how you build a kind of um, a, a, a movement or a structure in order to kind of address that and carry it forward, um, I, I don't know. <laughs> but hopefully that answers your question to some degree, that idea, those, the ideas that are here right in the center of the work, I suppose this work in particular, are to do with those relationships between very important pieces of, of, of building, of that relationship between or what an effect is, uh, what a surface is, and what a, <coughs> what, a, what, a, what a real working, practical kind of environment might be. I think to some extent it's, it's about the duration of the effect, because I, th I think what, 
there's a ten I mean David will know this better than than either of us two, but there, there seems to be a tendency towards the commissioning of an effect of a spectacle within architecture, something which is very immediate, that becomes the destination, that looks great in pictures, and then people say, great, let's all go to Bilbao, just to pick a random city off the top of my mm. head. Um, but... Cities, some cities that, don't know what they should be anymore, but mm. they know what they should be, what they should look, look like. like. What they have to look like. Yeah. It's a sense of like creating a logo of something, Absolutely. and I think uh, Turner Contemporary suffered from that at the beginning. You know, it had a rather difficult period, should we say? And there was a sense of the original building having, of being something spectacular, but which didn't actually work as a gallery. It would have been impossible to as a gallery, just unbelievably. And I think what's happened here is that there's a sense that the, the effect um, is something which should emerge over a long period, rather than just announce itself immediately and, in a sense, burn itself out in that, in that first ta-da. It's some, yeah, there's, there's a, sort right. of a, a slowness about turn it. Turn one people over more about what it is than what it looks like. Absolutely. Because sitting a building there, I mean, it's a very difficult site because it doesn't... Yeah. It doesn't belong to the city. It's isolated by the road. So we're in this sort of limbo land mm -hmm. between the sea and the city. So do you make a building that fits into the town or do you make a building that fits? And to be honest, it's a sort of industrial site. Yeah. And the program is nearly industrial and the, the budget was <laughs> industrial um, after the previous project had used up most of the money that mm -hmm. was... Um, On uh, tests and things. So. In a sense, I think, you know, I would understand people thinking, oh, it's, a, it's too big for its site, it's, you know, it's clumsy, you know. But actually, I think time, you know, it's become a sort of comfortable mm -hmm. place for people, mm -hmm. both artists to exhibit in Absolutely. and also people to be in. I think that's really and I think it's something, I mean, it sort of relates to what was said previously. It's something where people, sorry, it's something where people do feel like they're in the right space. I mean, they're the most beautiful galleries I think I've ever been in. Absolutely gorgeous. And when, like at the moment, Tracy Emin is on, not my favorite artist, but most beautifully lit spaces. And, you know, her work looks fantastic in there, in, the, in that space. The Turner exhibition just beforehand, there was at one point at the end of the exhibition where there were three late Turner seascapes. And I just thought, this is the most beautiful wall in the whole country. There can't be a nicer wall to sit and look at than this place. And everyone feels a sense of, everyone feels comfortable in there, it seems, without quite knowing why they, they are. It is light. I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, and we, you know, the problem is a lot of artists want dark spaces. <laughs> and, um, but I decided that given that they wouldn't have much budget to redo, you know, the, the idea was just to make three rooms that you could always just bang nails in the wall and hang paintings on it. It would never mm -hmm. cost you more than that. And that those rooms should be, therefore they had to be big enough to be exhibition rooms, but not, you know, not so big mm -hmm. that you would implicitly have to divide. That they should always be capable of being single spaces, mm -hmm. um, but you should be able to divide them up. So their scale was, was important, but above all of that, it was uh, the light that had mm -hmm. to be given their quality. And, and we had this wonderful, opportunity, not really accidental because of all the histories that you mm -hmm. talked about, that, you know, it's a site that faces north onto the sea and gets the most spectacular mm -hmm. light, so we wanted to, mm -hmm. to suck that in. That's very difficult to, to sell that mm. before you've got it, mm -hmm. you know, and it's very difficult to explain to people, yeah, you might not look like, you might not think that it's the best building from the outside because, mm -hmm. you know, and I can give you reasons, but actually inside it's going to be... Mm -hmm. Worth it. But. My wife is head of learning, so she has the learning studios with the big windows. So she, so she has the best so room in the whole building. <laughs> um, so everyone else is very jealous. And people just come into the room and just stare out the windows. It's, it's fantastic. Anyway, sorry. I, I know. Oh, sorry. Come to you next. Oh, okay. I think um, sitting as we are in a dance studio, something I wanted to pick up on 
um, that you were describing there, which is really the experience of space um, and how so much um, in, in our cities is mediated. And so we have, as people like Plasma have discussed, you know, this sort of sense of just a sort of distant and removed and visual spectacle. And I really wanted to ask Graham whether he feels his work sort of gets underneath that sort of spectacle, that sort of mediation, or whether, you know, we're looking at slides and so on, whether you just intensify that problem in relation to the built environment. No, I don't <laughs> intensify it. <laughs> um, that's not my intention. I think I, I touched on this before, this, uh, and it's related to the idea of um, this notion of transparency in, in, in the work, that we, that, we, that we are allowed to see the, the workings and the materials involved and, and see that as the subject, not, not an effect, not a, not a, uh, a, a spectacle. Um, but actually, I mean, I was, uh, I was at the Hackney weekend yesterday with, you know, Jay-Z on the big stage and stuff. You're with Jay-Z. He wasn't I with was Jay-Z. When he says with Jay-Z, <laughs> um, I just with. feel I should clarify. <laughs> I'm glad you were there for that, Jess, because they would have made the wrong song. <laughs> yeah, um, it is actually but, Kanye West. This is you Kanye. know that's that spectacle. That's the spectacle. That's the, the use of light as 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 dramatization of the situation. I mean, all you had really was, you know, a couple of guys on stage with microphones, very good at doing what they were doing, but then there was this huge amount of surrounding information and stuff that was enabling to, the, to kind of lift this and make it visual. Cam and, and for the cameras, for the mediation of it, for the transportation of it, for the everything else. Um, and, and light being used in that intensity and, and, and with that light and movement, the movement of light um, and the address of light, the way the lights would suddenly address the audience and then the audience would see themselves on the screens and then back to the performers. And that really incredibly complicated. I don't really know why I'm talking about that, but I was thinking about that in terms of light and spectacle. And when I saw that yesterday, I was, you know, this is the other end of that, I, I think. It's absolutely, it isn't about spectacle, it's about thinking. It's about thinking what light is and what it does when it's pointed at something on its simplest level. So that's where its kind of concern is. I think spectacle often, the intention of spectacle is often is to make the audience passive. Yeah. And if, or, or if they are to act, they're, they're to act in a very particular way. So, so a concert is a very good example of that, where you know, it goes through peaks and troughs of, of, a, of, uh, of ecstasy, in a sense, of, of trying to control what people are doing and thinking. That's how spectacle works really well. I think what's really interesting about these works is that it confuses people about what it is that they're looking at and why they're looking at it, and then they can walk around it. So you become very active and you become very aware of your body in a space. And I, I would say the same for, for Turner Contemporary as well. You become incredibly aware of yourself in the space, that you have this space around you and the way that you would move around. But you're not directed in the, in the way that, that one often is in galleries, for example, now, where galleries, where exhibitions themselves have become cultural spectacles the blockbuster that you directed from one, you look at this one, then you look at this one, then you look at this one. Because of the sort of proportions of those spaces, you can walk in and you can go in any direction in a way. But we, we also have, we do overlight everything. I mean, that's one mm. problem of our time is that there is an expectation of what, what light levels should be. Mm. Mm. And it's very funny when you're thrown into places, I mean, we're doing a, a building in, uh, in Perm in the middle of Russia, you know, just before the Urals. I mean, it's, it was an isolated city, and it's probably one of the most forgotten cities in some way. But if you're in the middle of the winter there, I mean, it's quite shocking how dark everything is, because there's still work, you know, you go into a little shop, and it's just got one little mm. bolt. I mean, it's fantastically mm. romantic in that sense. You know, you sort of, it's like how the world used to be. You know, mm -hmm. you'd have, so everything is completely underlit, except certain things then shine out. But it's very interesting when you just bring everything back. Sure. You know, you sort of turn the volume down. Mm. Then I think the problem is that we've turned the volume up yeah. much too much. And even in, in uh, museum lighting, it's a, it's a tyranny because mm -hmm. there's now an expectation of light to be at a, at a certain cons you know, consistent level. And that's what you fight with doing museums is that the curators want a consistency of 
of lighting. And that means that you can't use daylight. I mean, they, they are trying to, that Vanish. innocent decision mm -hmm. starts, you know, so you are fighting against this sort of uh, synthetic light. Mm -hmm. And we're just doing a museum in St. Louis where we can actually daylight the building for 70% of the year. You wouldn't need to turn the lights on. But the curators say, yeah, but people that come in will think that we're not, you know, they'll think we're that open. we're come to turn the lights on. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, they used to, they used to lights going onto paintings. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, so it's the light's a, a sign, of, sign of activity, of, of, mm -hmm. yeah. of, of, of openness. But it's mm -hmm. interesting culturally because in German, Germany, Switzerland especially, um, you don't light paintings, you, you light the room. So the, the expectation of the amount of light that's on a painting in Germany and Switzerland is very different than it is in uh, England or America. And that's just to do with expectation. You know, you can go into mm. certain museums in Germany and they seem very dark. But actually, sometimes the paintings look fantastic mm -hmm. because, you know, there's more depth mm -hmm. in the painting mm -hmm. because of this changing light. Mm -hmm. There's another question just over here, I think. Uh, Graham, I liked your idea of uh, money as fuel and sort of throwing fuel onto the fire until it's spent in this blaze of light. Uh, so a, a technical question to you and then maybe more abstract question to David. I was curious to know how much it costs to run one of these rigs. <laughs> um, and David, have you ever thought of money as a building material? Um, so something in concrete terms that you might almost use as a building block in your projects? You mean the physical money? <laughs> money. Yeah, um, actual figures. Uh, uh, I mean, obviously, it's different each time uh, because the amount of lights and, and the amount of time, etc. Um, for Recolva, for example, I think we, if you really want to know figures, I think this costs something because you've got to pay labor. I mean, these things, you know, that it's not just, so that's all part of the work. The, the crew are part of the work as well. Um, so you've got to pay, so it's not, only that. So I think, I think we spent about something around ten thousand pounds to make the recolver piece happen. Twelve. It's more than that. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> Here's my archive. Yeah, I was. Uh, yeah, I was memory. On this. I have a very bad memory of uh, of these things, but I, I I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe the total budget for the world is more. Like, I don't know. But Jeremy is suggesting it was twenty. So somewhere between twelve and twenty thousand pounds makes one of these pieces of work. Um, in, in Sharjah, for example, I've got no idea how much it costs because that was all negotiated outside of myself with, with, the, with the council and the sheikh and the people who have been brought in to work for him, etc. So that I think maybe many favors were being done as well as uh, money being spent. Uh, That's what artists are, you see. They don't have to worry about budget. <laughs> we we <laughs> subsidize them. So this well, is the yeah, big difference here. This on is our behalf. I mean, no, but I do. We do worry about the budget because suddenly there's not enough. You know, there's, well, there won't be there won't be enough lights then for that situation. And then you've but the got thing to is, what's of, interesting well, there isn't is a fee. You, can't, you can't measure it. I mean, you can't mm. judge it in the same way. Sure. And I think that's a, the problem for I mean, I tell you exactly how. So, back now, is you know, how is the budget established for a building? Essentially, a client works out how many square meters they want, then they take a per square meter rate and they borrow that from a comparable building. And normally, they take that from a sort of reasonably low level or you know, optimistic at that moment, because you're trying to make the thing, when you're trying to make something work in the first instance, you multiply those two things together and you get a budget. And then they always forget to add a few more things on which would make it something. So essentially then, that bubble is pre-described. So it's set at so many square meters, which are fixed by so much per square meter, which sets the quality of the building. You multiply that together, and that's the budget. And then the architect spends the next you know, year working with these handcuffs on, mm. trying to, to get more out of that. Um, but the difference between you know, a good building and a bad building isn't that a client will just say, oh, well, why don't we just double it? You know, or, <laughs> um, 
Does that happen, uh, happen often? No, <laughs> never. I mean, that's, that's the No, sir. I mean, have you had a, <laughs> yeah. So you will be, it's not a matter of persuading your client that, you know, this should be more. You actually have to. to I mean, that's, there are special clients, there are special projects, and, there, and of course, sometimes the square meter rate is set at a very good level, you know, and that, then, that, then the architect spends, you know, it's got a slightly easier time, but, you know, all the decisions on the project are made at that moment. It's very, and very difficult if they're made wrong, you know, you, whatever the architect does, your, your opportunities to escape that are limited. And just to answer your question, so at that point, you know, you, you are building out of money. You know exactly what you can build. And you, it is not about, you know, you don't have much choice. Because first of all, in order to achieve that budget, you, you've literally got to do what the budget set up. In other words, achieve that number of square meters for that. So your first task is to get that big thing done. Then the second is to see whether you can cheat anywhere by moving some of that money from one area to another. And that's to do with prioritization. I mean, do you spend it on materials or do you spend it on you know, the scale of the room? Or do you, you know, but you are literally moving things around. And I, I think so in that sense, you are. You're, you're literally building out of money. And the, and the essential things take 80% of your budget away to start with. You know, it's very difficult not to build foundations. You know, I mean, you sort of can't really skimp. Um, so your groundworks and your foundations, are, you, know, you don't have a choice about that. Your, your structure, has, you know. So before you know where you are, the bits that you're playing with are quite small. They're quite small, you know, margins. I like the idea of the, ar of the, architecture, of the architect as an escape artist. Somebody who has to, you know, work with handcuffs on, like you say, and uh, find a way of escaping a situation which is given. Yeah, um, and a good architect is one that succeeds in, in making the best and fastest. But also, you, you've got to keep working through things. So you've you've got to find better quality out of the same money, and often that means revisiting and revisiting and revisiting and proving that if you took this company window and asked them to do it again in that way, maybe you can get something. So again, you're fighting time, which in the client's opinion is money. So. It's a very, you know, you are, I don't want this to sound like a, you know, feel sorry for architects time, but, you know, that the creativity of the architect is to work under these things. And that's, you know, it goes back to my point, first of all, is that, you know, unless the conditions, unless we value better, um, you know, what architects do on behalf of us all, then it's all, it's down to a one by one struggle and therefore we get the buildings we get and we get the, you know, the exceptions like this building, um, you know, they're not the norm, they're the exception, they're the exception of you know, a dedicated architect and a, a committed client fighting beyond the norm. I mean, it doesn't make sense. I mean, to be honest, that's not, that's not a, a viable you know, model to operate continuously under. Mm -hmm. We've just got time for one more question. That's, uh Question just at the back. Thank you. Uh, Graham, when you were giving your presentation, there was a part of me that was kind of skeptical, thinking, here's a guy who's just taking some light, going into remote areas and illuminating them. And then I thought, actually, it's quite a good idea that you're doing that. OK. And uh, <laughs> someone's got to do it. And I was actually thinking from an urban perspective, those places are almost symptomatic of dispossessed uh, sectors of the population, you know, people that are excluded, people that uh, or minority groups, or and in a way, by highlighting the urban realm, they also there's an analogy to the social aspect of those spaces, and that they become abandoned within our city. And the question that I had uh, from you is, how do you actually choose which areas you go in to illuminate? How many lights? You know, what is your working methodology? And my question for David is, in a sense, in creating the utopian situation of each site trying to be mindful of not wasting clients' money and creating decent, um, good quality architecture that enhances the place. What is your perception of the reverse, you know, the idea of dystopia um, and 
uh, do you look at a site, say, where the Margate building was going, thinking, well, actually, there are certain endemic problems within that town that this building, in a sense, can solve? That's the last question. Right. Um, so uh, I'd, like, I'd like to think um, of the spaces choosing me as much as me choosing them, um, which is not an escape route. Um, but, but true to a certain degree. Um, so I had, you know, for the Recolva piece, I, I had this idea for the, for the light work before I, I'd, I'd been invited to this site. Um, and when I went to the site, I, I thought, well, this, this piece could work here. Um, um, it would be reasonable proposition to, to, to do it here, to find out whether this, to, you know, to make this piece for the first time. And then that link about, I, I hadn't thought about that idea about painting directly onto the landscape. So, but until I was there, and then that, in, that, that idea in relation to my material ap appeared, and that seemed like a good bridge to cross. So that was the first example of, of, of that space, and it, and it kind of, it comes to me as well as, because I could have chosen not to do that piece there. It could have, uh, no, that's not right. So I had this piece that I was kind of carrying around with me, and it, it found its space there first. Um, and, then, and then since then, as, you know, as I've kind of, the piece has kind of, Grown, I suppose. Um, the the Newcastle one was more was more to do with my with more to do with my choice, um, I, you know, because we we did a lot of walking around Newcastle, and uh, but that just seemed that that, that that just that area there just seems such an opportunity to um, to 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 get to grips with this notion of the of a, of the accidental space or the uh, architectures colliding or this space actually being a piece of architecture in the negative, uh, uh, unthought of, um, et cetera. So uh, there are strengths to these, to these, to these various um, spaces that, that seem to kind of um, attract, attract me or attract this, the work, works well in those spaces. Um, and I guess, yeah, they are, they, are, they are these kind of liminal spaces or these spaces of, of becoming or or, 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 or spaces that are in limbo. I'm, I'm kind of interested in that because that allows me, that allows me a kind of freedom, uh, in order to address a whole, a kind of broader uh, uh, area, subject area. Um, so there's, there's not, a, there's not a specificity about what I'm writing. Um, there isn't really a subject. Um, so, yeah. And on to. <laughs> What can you remember the rest of the question? <laughs> you're, in a way, you're touching on the idea of building as a degenerative thing. And I, I think it was a, for me, it was a sort of strange coincidence that you know, we did two buildings in two cities that were two towns that needed you know, investment, um, two cultural buildings. And um, I was at pains to continuously argue that you know, if you, if you want, want a museum, you need a museum. I mean, you, you shouldn't build a museum because it will bring regeneration, right? Because the danger is then you build an unwanted museum. Um, so the question is how do you, you know, that, yeah, that you shouldn't, you can't justify such buildings by the fact that they will bring regeneration. The fact that they will bring regeneration, I think, is, is, you know, is useful, but the problem is in this country, we can only get politicians to be interested in culture or good architecture if they think there's a reward. And that's a very different position, let's say in Germany, where culture is meant to be you know, provided by the state and it should be a, a, a fundamental value of soci society, uh, not something that um, has to pay, you know, has to bring, bring a reward. Having said that, you know, I do think you have to take care um, and we have to acknowledge the fact that these temples of culture are potentially dangerous in that, you know, it's very easy to get people who are familiar with museums to go into a new museum, wherever it is, uh, but it's not so easy to get people that, you know, are not familiar with going to museums and I think that's the, that's the challenge. And, um, uh, you know, I've worked in America on a number of occasions in sort of Midwest towns where it's cities where, you know, there's a very strong connection to the community by necessity because the money will only come 
uh, if everyone's convinced that it's an important um, uh, you know, addition to the, to the culture of that city. So there will be patrons, but at the same time, the city, I mean, you, you, you know, I've built in, in uh, Iowa and Alaska and now in, in uh, Missouri, and the public speeches you have to give to, to reassure everybody that this is a worthwhile um, uh, venture are really boring in some sense, but actually quite good because it's a real test, um, you know, of that relationship. And actually, uh, it reminds everybody the, the, the purpose. So by the time the building's open, um, it's already quite, it seems to have, own, you know, there is an ownership, whether that's Anchorage or whether it's in Des Moines. We did a public library in Des Moines. You know, in all of those cases, by the time the building opens, there is a sort of community ownership. Um, in Germany, that doesn't happen because the state pays the money, and they don't even know the building's happening until the, till it's open, and then it's when it's open, and it's so that's the other extreme. My experience here was a sort of sort of in the middle, um, in so far as that in Wakefield, the politicians generally were completely indifferent to the whole process and needed to be told continuously that this will be good for Wakefield. Even then, they were sort of indifferent, I mean, shockingly. So, of course, now it's been successful, they're all, you know, all um, the first in the queue. And, and um, uh, I think in Kent, there was a much bigger, in, t in Turner, there was a much more, commit there was much more commitment to, to the institution because it had been running already. And so I think that was a much <coughs> But what we tried to do was to make that building, um, you know, I always sort of talked about it as being the town hall, you know, that, that it should somehow <coughs> have an accessibility. It's a sort of cultural town hall. It's not meant to be a, um, you know, a temple. And, and so therefore I think it is, you know, it is incumbent on architects to think about how they might find uh, empathy with architecture, because I think that's, that is the problem of modern architecture. There's not a sufficient empathetic relationship between society and modern architecture. Um, I don't think you can always solve that about how buildings look, but I think you can make steps towards it in terms of the way buildings perform. And I think that's been the success of probably both those buildings, but for Turner even more, because Turner's, you know, it's a 15 million pound project, and it's a tiny little thing but you know, they've had half a million people there, and it's been taken on by, by the town. So I would say, you know, I don't think you can build a building like that on the basis that it's gonna turn around the fortunes of the town. I think you, there's plenty of examples of that not happening, but I think it can certainly make a contribution if it's part of a, an ongoing program, which I think it does exist yeah. in, in uh, Margate very, very convincingly. You know, everyone always talks about Bill Bow and that, you know, that that building uh, became a sort of symbol of regeneration. But actually, Bilbao had an enormous program of activities, subways, housing, parks, you know. The museum was just the highest profile component of that, but it was substantially backed up by the city um, in many, many other ways, which is, you know, why, you know, a new airport, you know, da -da -da, you know. So, it wasn't just you parachute in a funny piece of architecture and all of a sudden the fortunes of a city change, which is what most local politicians in this country would like to believe. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think we need, we need to wrap up there, but um, I just hope you will join me in thanking uh, Graham and David very much. It was a really fascinating uh, conversation. I'm sure we could go on. Um, I think we can go on downstairs, can't we? There's going to be some drink downstairs. We can go on and on. Um, we can have a chat. So uh, thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, Graham. Thank you. Thank you very much.